And so, um, when, so, whoops. So uh, I guess uh, Jones will start, not Jones, um, Randy will start us off with uh, our introductions, cue it to you for the uh, libations, and then it'll be back to me, I think. Is that right, Kayanne? Back to me. I'm going to say a few words, and then I'm going to share yeah. uh, your presentation. Yeah. And um, and then uh, we'll have a little quick break, and um, and then we'll have a conversation. I see one of your future PhD professors just uh, waiting in the waiting room, Shauna Kay. Dr. Lynn Aylward from Acadia University. And just a note to our people online, this is going out live on uh, Facebook, as or not Facebook, on YouTube as of right now, because we had to set that up right at this moment to, to get it going at the same time so we can send the link out just so people are aware. Right. I'm going to shut my camera off. I just got a, I just got a, a text asking somebody for the link. Is there a YouTube, do they just, if they go to YouTube, do they just click on DBDLI? I'll, I'll put it in the chat so you can copy it, okay? Okay. Hi, Sima. How's it going back home, Nana? Are you enjoying your trip? Yes, yes, yes. But I'm just, yeah. How's your eye doing? Well, uh, slow, slow. It's still not clear. So, okay. Yeah. But I, Did yeah. they tell you how long it'll take? Well, some said two to four weeks, and then they said months. So, you know, I know. Oh, okay. It depends person to person, I guess. Yeah, yeah, right. Hopefully more on the week side and less of the months. Yeah, I know. Right on. Did you enjoy some birthday celebrations? No, we haven't done anything yet. You got to do something when you're feeling yeah. better enough, well enough yeah. to do so. Yeah. Yeah. You got to celebrate yeah. well, rest yeah. and relax. It's been a very mm -hmm. crazy year. So you deserve yeah. that rest, yeah. Nana. Yeah. 
iya
We know that Ubuntu is an Ubuntu Bantu term for humanity. The whole idea of being the self through others and how we come to this humanness. Now, as also others have note, right, including uh, Tamale, we look at this as a traditional ideology of justice and fairness, but it's grounded in indigenous philosophies of good, humanness, communitarianism, solidarity, and interdependence. And to me, the, the point here is that why I don't want to conflict the sociology of knowledge with the critical epistemology, the fact is that the rich African intellectual traditions of Ubuntu philosophy was born out of African struggles, resistance, and liberation. And it has been advanced within an anti-capitalist and counter-colonial lens. As a philosophy of practice, Ubuntu advances critical African scholarship to append our mental and intellectual enslavement. Clearly, it also acknowledges the dialectics of theory and social practice, while we engage the African body as a site of knowing, as a site and place of action. When it comes to the African Black experience, right, the question has always been, how do we assert the locus of control over our story? And how we tell our stories implicating our identities, our histories and cultures, and our lived experiences. And this is why, to me, I've always this made this point, and, and in one of the pieces I wrote, well, one of my students, I talk about the importance of vocalizing our politics with our adherence to the fact that why we say to know is to act. To me, to know is to act politically and responsibly that the African black scholar must deploy a spiritual remembrance of the Ubuntu saying, quote, I am because we are, and because we are, therefore I am. So framing a positionality, I think to me to find and articulate 
a centeredness, as Amy Cesare Malifiasanti, others have talked about, finding one center, a centeredness in conversations about Africanness, Blackness, and Euro modernity in order to build the solidarities that I'm talking about for new Afro features. We need an intersectional centric analysis that encapsulates the specificities of Black diasporic experiences as well as the historical connections with the motherland. We know Blackness is race, but it's also cultural, political, and social historical, historical construction, which is experienced differently on African bodies in different geospaces and contexts. In particular, the African Black experience in white supremacist fascist contexts highlights the importance of these notions about color, body image, representation, cultural identity, and politics, and how they conflict, and there's a confluence. So while complicating understandings of Black community in terms of being complex, multifaceted, it's also filled with tensions and is contested, I would argue that we must still hold on to its political and spiritual force of coming to a collective Black African human being. Uh, who are joining us from around the world this evening. I would like to uh, take this time to acknowledge that those who are gathered here at the Delmar Bodley Learning Institute, I want to welcome you as well for joining us in person. We are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This land is governed by the treaties of peace and friendship the first signed in 1726. It is important to remember that we are on land that was never surrendered. We offer this land acknowledgement in part to honor the truth and reconciliation. In the same spirit, we wish to acknowledge our Black African Nova Scotian ancestors who came before us and paved the path for us to travel. We recognize the 400 plus years history of the communities of African and the African descent and the 52 communities in Nova Scotia of African descent and throughout uh, this region. Our ancestors experienced disparities but taught us never to give up and to care for one another. We will preserve just as they did. We stand in solidarity with our indigenous brothers and sisters. We have a wonderful evening plan for you today. And I'm sure you will be, you'll be able to engage and you'll be inspired by what we have planned for you tonight. Tonight's conversation will be recorded. So, uh, and, and we will be able to view this recording at a later date uh, via the DVDI's YouTube channel. With this in mind, we kindly ask you uh, to refrain from recording with using your personal device as a professional recording will be available. We're truly honored to have Nana, Dr. George Isafa Day with us virtually this evening to share uh, what is uh, a continuation of the presentation that we began at the DBLI's Afrocentric Conference earlier this uh, spring. The theme of that conference was transformation through Ubuntu. And we are grateful for Dr. Days uh, for taking this time to share, during that time he shared, and for providing us with a deeper understanding of the Afrocentric philosophy. 
while the chat function has, uh, has been disabled right now, um, we encourage you to, to engage and, uh, and, and our co-moderators, Dr. Wendy Mackey, who is uh, on there, and uh, Shana K. Lawrence, they will be um, they will be following the presentation. They they will have a Q and A session. Following the Q and A sessions, they will be prompting you to uh, with question and answers, and I'll ask for you to post your questions in there, and uh, they will um, read those questions to for response um, from Dr. Day. And now I turn. I want you to turn your attention to our libation ceremony which is being presented now. Thank you, everyone. And wasn't that a beautiful uh, ceremony by the Asokore peoples of Ghana? You saw Dr. Day uh, there in that celebration. My name is Dr. Wendy Mackey, and it's my pleasure to be um, your moderator this evening. And I know that in our introduction, we had um, a little bit of both Dr. Day, who we will affectionately um, refer to as Nana this evening, and it is a great blessing. Um, Nana's work informs all of my work in decolonizing educational spaces. Um, there's nothing that I have written where I haven't quoted <laughs> Nana. And so Professor Day, Ghanaian born, renowned seminal educator and writer considered um, by most people who know is our foremost Canadian scholar on race, anti-racism studies, black uh, education, Afrocentric education, African indigeneity and anti-colonial thought. And we are so pleased with the help of the DeVoe Fund um, that we are able to have this lecture series. And so we'll thank him later on, but I need to thank the DeVoe Fund and um, Mr. Bill Gunn is online with us tonight who manages that fund and has made this lecture uh, possible. Professor Day, not only in his own right, Dr. Day, Professor, but he also has uh, honorary doctorate from the University of South Africa. Um, Professor Day is a 2015, 2016, 2018, 2019 Carnegie African Diasporan Fellow in August of 2012. Dr. Day also received, um, sorry, um, he was elected the Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, the most prestige, prestigious award for an academic scholar. He also received the 2016 Whitworth Award for Educational Research from the Canadian Education Association, awarded to the Canadian scholar whose research and scholarship have helped shape Canadian national educational policy and practice. 
He's also the 2019 Paulo Ferreira Democratic Project um, Chapman University U.S. Social Justice Award winner. In April of 2021, Professor Day received the Lifetime Achievement Award from Ontario Alliance of Black School Educators for his longstanding work promoting Black um, and youth, Black youth education. Professor Day in October 2022 was named the Silver Trust Media as one of the 100 most influential Black Canadians nationwide. In March of 2023, Professor Day has received the highly prestigious 2023 President's Impact Award given to a University of Toronto scholar whose work has reached beyond the walls of academia to significantly impact local communities, national communities, and international communities. Also in April of 2023, Professor Day was given an honorary research associateship in the Center of Excellence in Disabilities from the University of South Africa. Professor Day has 44 books and over 80 uh, referee journal articles to his credit. Finally, in June of 2007, Professor Day was installed as a traditional chief in Ghana um, of the town of Osokore um, in New, I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing these right, New Juaben traditional area of Ghana. His school name is Nana, um, Nana Aduse Seifa Twenboa. And it is a great honor that we are here tonight to listen to Dr. Day and just some notes about how tonight will flow. Um, Dr. Day currently is in Ghana. And so because of internet issues, um, he spent the time in free recorded his lecture tonight. Now, Dr. Day is online and will be part of the question and answer afterwards. So we're gonna ask while the uh, recording is, is going on, if we could make sure that we're all muted and you might find because it's a recording, the sound might go down a little bit. Um, and so, and about the chat feature, as we're watching the recording, you might want to uh, note your thoughts, but it won't be until the break time that myself, and I'm, I'm so pleased that during the question and answer session, we'll be having a conversation with myself, Nana, and my graduate student, Shauna K. Lawrence, who's also online uh, this evening. And so if during the break, you could put your questions in the chat box, Shauna K and I will go through them and we'll try to get as many answered uh, as we can. And so without further ado, um, you did not come to hear me speak. And so I'm just going to give me a moment and I will transition into uh, Dr. Day's lecture for this evening. So I want to begin by recognizing the land on which we uh, uh, and appreciate all the blessings and the teachings of the land. I also want to acknowledge the ancestors uh, and welcome them into the room for this conversation. And I also want to give thanks. I also want to give thanks to um, the organizers of this lecture, particularly the Delmo Body Day Learning Institute. We're having this inaugural lecture and this is the third in session and to invite me to, to speak, uh, particularly all those who had a hand in organizing this, right from Sylvia, George, uh, Kian, and of course, uh, my graduate student, Seema, and all the media folks who um, ensure that this event will be highly publicized. Right? I, I come to this discussion uh, bearing the gifts of knowledge from my ancestors, as the late Maya Angelou would say. And um, I think it's a blessing to be with uh, all the knowledge that have been imparted to us by our elders and our ancestors. I'm very particularly interested in how we empower Black and African and West Christian learners and educators to define the challenges that affect our community 
and how we think through solutions to addressing um, the, the, the problems affecting our community. And in this regard, the whole question of black solidarities, right? How we think through black solidarity using our indigenous philosophies uh, become important to my to my thinking. So there are certain questions, for example, that would guide the way I look at this conversation. One is how do we as black and African researchers uh, learn as indicators in the words of Kodoyanka, pioneer new analytical systems for understanding our own communities that are steeped in our own homegrown cultural perspectives. And in this regard to how do we articulate the nexus of blackness and Africanness, which is grounded in the Ubuntu philosophy. And I want to speak about the black African humanhood which is um, a, a sort of knowledge base, which is informed by how we strike solidarities, how we build relationalities, how we make connections, and how we uh, build on the mutual interdependence that we have as a people. And we cannot think through this without looking at the convergences of um, philosophical thoughts like black centricity, Afrocentricity, and Afrocentricity in a way they help us to understand the challenges of inclusive education for um, new futures for our young learners. So I start with the foundations of the Ubuntu philosophy and how they implicate or apply to inclusive education. As we all know, Ubuntu is an Igunu Bantu term for humanity, uh, being self through others. And that was coming to humanist in relationalities. And, and as a traditional philosophical thought, we know that uh, the Ubuntu philosophy um, is a traditional ideology of justice and fairness, and is grounded in indigenous philosophies of, quote, humanness, communitarianism, solidarity, and interdependence, unquote, as articulated by uh, Tamale. Now, there's a saying in Ubuntu that we are human only through the humanity of, with and of others. And Ubuntu espouses certain teachings, which I call the land in the teachings. This can be seen as literacies of relationality, sharing, reciprocity, connections, mutual interdependence, building relationships, social responsibility, and accountability to enrich conversations to subvert uh, that can be tapped into to enrich conversations to subvert the communities of schooling and to promote schooling as community, as I've argued elsewhere. Now, while not conflicting the sociology of knowledge with critical epistemology, uh, I maintain that Ubuntu philosophy was born out of African struggles, resistance, and liberation. This philosophy is framed within an anti-capitalist, anti-colonial, decolonial lens. And that it is a philosophy of practice that advances critical African scholarship, which is necessary to append our mental, intellectual enslavement. Ubuntu also acknowledges the dialectics of theory as well as social practice, the fusion of dialectics of theory and social practice. And it, acknowledges also the fact that the African cell, the African body, the black cell, is a site, a source, and place of knowing. You know, when it comes to the black African experience, the question has always been, how do we accept the locus of control over our story? How do we begin to tell our own stories in our own ways, stories about ourselves? How do we talk about our identities, our histories, our cultures, and our lived experiences? grounded in our own epistems, in our own ways of knowing. And this is very, very important. And this is one of the things that we can use the Ubuntu philosophy to think through uh, how we come to understand some of our contemporary uh, our problems and the solutions that we need to seek to address them. And it's, in this regard, it's very, very important that as we move, move along this path, right, that we vocalize our politics as um, I've argued with uh, one of my uh, students, Andrea Vakis, right? Uh, and when we vocalize our politics, yes, we know that to know is to act, but to us is to act 
politically, responsibly, and timelessly. That the African educator, the African learner must develop a spiritual remembrance of this Ubuntu feeling that, or, or Ubuntu saying that I am because we are and because we are, therefore I am. It's very, very important for that regard. Now, how do we move to frame the Ubuntu epistemic challenge as it affects the question of black education? The search and pursuit of education that makes sense is grounded in our lived existential realities, our cultures and histories is very, very important in this regard. We need to find and articulate our centeredness in the words of Amy Cesare and also Melifia Sanchi in conversations about our Africanness and connect our Africanness to our Blackness as we begin to build this, this new solidarities for new futures. We also have to espouse an intersectional centric analysis that encapsulates right, the, the, the importance of Black diasporic experience and making historic connections with the motherland. To understand this blackness as race, but also as a cultural and a political and social historical construction. And to acknowledge blackness as experienced differently on bodies in different lands, on different Jewish spaces. This very, very important. The notion of the intersectional centric analysis, the connection with the motherland. Blackness as fused with Africanness, but also hanging on to Blackness as race, but also as a cultural, political, and social cultural construction, and to acknowledge Blackness in the way it's experienced differently on different lands, on different bodies, and on different spaces. Significantly, the Black African experience in white supremacist context highlights the saliency of race, Blackness, and anti Blackness as lodged in skin color, but also in body image representation, culture, identity, and politics. We also understand that the Black community itself is not homogeneous. So we need to complicate our understandings of the Black community as complex, as multifaceted, as tension-filled, and as contested. Nonetheless, we still hold on to the power, the spiritual force, of coming to a collective African humanhood. And this is something that the Black centricity, uh, a philosophy as embedded in Ubuntu seeks to articulate. Within global capital, global diaspora and particularly international mobility, we know that the Black experience is always in question and it's in quote, dialectic opposition to Americanists Europeanness and Canadianness, as Harris and Bed have long argued. But this is the more reason why we need to be skeptical of those African bodies, Black bodies, who insist that race as color is meaningless, because in their thinking, it serves as a false descriptor. And in their own thinking, that Black is a meaningless category or is an imported label. So they would prefer to talk about the identity of African. Now, I would maintain that this shouldn't be either or. We can talk about Black, we can talk about African, but we seek a connection uh, because of their different situatedness and the geographies in which we are, to be able to speak about that connection. So I would interrogate the continuing problem of some Africans strategically distancing or de-racing themselves from Blackness. Because at the end of the day, the dehumanization and racialization of the Black human good does not happen solely when Black bodies reach indigenous lands of the Americas or Europe. We see it even on the continent. And it's very, very important for us to connect our understandings of Blackness with Africanness in order to understand this common Black African human good that I'm espousing. The colonial dominant has consistently sought to mess us up in terms of our identities, but also our racially politicized identifications. 
for black African bodies who fail to question this, I see it as a black betrayal. I see this as a black race to innocence. And it's a disavowal of the historic struggles of our ancestors. I want to move on to, um, because I've been using terms like Afrocentricity, Afrocentricity, and Black centricity. And I want us to see the convergences, but also engage how we can engage these terms to decolonize questions of curriculum, pedagogy, and our institutions. Monifi Asante long ago rightly argued that Afrocentricity is the investigation of social phenomena from the perspective that centers or grounds the African learner in their own research and learning. Asante would further argue that Afrocentricity is a mode of thought as well as action. And it is an, quote, enterprise of human regeneration, unquote, that challenges, quote, human supremacist ideas, white supremacist ideas in the imagination of the African world and by extension, the entire world, unquote. Bolivia Santi. Similarly, Ama Mazama, in uh, a quotation by Bolema Karinga, speaks of there are, quote, shared orientations of Afrocentric philosophy, cosmology, azology, and epistemology, unquote, such as the centrality of community, responsibility, tradition, high levels of spirituality, and ethical concern, harmony with nature the sociality of selfhood and the veneration of ancestors and elders as part of the unity of being African. And this to me, these ideas of Afrocentricity are very, very important. And Afrocentricity works with these ideas, but it builds on this by also highlighting the centrality of the elder crit. That's the cultural values of community, cooperation, mutuality, solidarity, interpersonal relations, and social veneration as a derived and informed knowledge base, which is rooted in the material and technological achievements of the ancient African kingdoms and civilizations like Kemet, Nubia, Zimbabwe, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, Dahomey, Asante, Oyo, Yoruba, and etc. So the what Afrocentricity does is that it brings in the African elder crate. And the African elder crate highlights some sequent teachings. The elder crate of Afrocentricity is grounded on the intertwining notions of life before death, life after death, and the continuation of the world of the living and the world of the dead. In other words, the dead does not leave the living alone but closely monitors two vices and interferes in affairs of the living. Occasionally, the dead returns to the living in the form of the newborn. They believe in the African reincarnations to finish uncompleted tracks. The living understands the inter and the intra relations with the dead. Hence, ancestral veneration is encoded in indigenous African traditions and epistems. In a shared vein, Black centricity, which I'm espousing, offers a Black diasporic social thought and theorizing as a discursive prism of coming to a Black authenticity wearing no damn white mats. It is a form of radical Black perspectivism that highlights the interplay of race, color, culture, spirituality, politics as significant in analyzing and interpreting the conjoining forces of global diasporic Black and African experiences and existential realities. As a theoretical framing, Black centricity focuses on the set for an explanatory power of the Black diasporic experience through history through land, through geographies, culture, and politics. As a perspectivism, Black centricity also help 
provide answers to questions of black life in global diaspora. The black body becomes a knower, becomes a thinker, and is also working with an embodied blackness. And this embodied blackness can be viewed as an embodied episteme that instructs black blackness to combine steady work, activism, and militancy in the academic and social spaces that we find ourselves. In other words, a form of black positivity. Black centricity calls for acknowledging the continued significance of the rich heritage of African and black intellectuality that fuses politics and advocacy. And I always talk about the question of the power of being an academic warrior. That means for a black educator, for, for the educator, the black learner, you can be nothing else but be an academic warrior. Failure to do that is a betrayal of our ancestors. Our life is about resistance, and we need to work with this. So let me focus a bit more about black centricity as a framework for centering the black experience in education. First of all, we need to locate blackness and Africanness in a specific body of black diaspora thought and educational practice in, in Canada. And to insist on blackness and, and Africanness that is framed within an indigenous African identity, which is outside of that identity, which has and continues to be constructed within Euro-American hegemony and ideology. The African and the black learner in the diaspora context must speak from the positionality of our blackness and Africanness in the white supremacist world, using the body as in flesh, and also calling on our spiritual knowings. And I brought the word in flesh for mojito, it's tahito. Set training of the Black and African in Black centricity is deliberate. It is intended to register the confluence of race, color, culture, spirituality, history, so as to implicate and invoke and also advocate for global black radical politics. You see, we need to understand the European creation of black pathology that Amy Cesare long ago talked about, and Fanon also speaks about this, this black pathology. The European creation of black pathology served two purposes. One, it was to justify the subhumanity of black peoples black and African peoples. But two, it was to separate our blackness from Africanness, so as to reinforce the discourse of white dominance and fascism. So you separate blackness from Africanness, you deroute and fetish the project of dominance. And as I've argued in many places, and I know uh, Paul Ajay also makes this point, right? The crisis of blackness in Euro-American context can only be seen as a crisis of memory against forgetfulness. And this crisis of memory against forgetfulness to create a form of blackness, which is devoid of history, is devoid of place, origin, and of spiritual grounding. And let me ground this in some concrete examples. You know, the Cape Coast slave dungeons in Ghana, as well as the House of Slaves on Gori Island in Senegal, both have the caption on the last door used by millions of Africans who were shipped to North America. And the caption reads, door of no return. For enslaved Africans, the door of no return should be their last glimpse of their African identity. Consequently, enslaved Africans were violently deprived of their cultures, their traditions, their names, their languages, and religions. But this didn't stop there. Relatedly, Africans who stayed behind were similarly deprived of our cultures, 
our traditions, our names, our languages, and religions through European colonial education and religion. This is a point that Nguji Bathiengo made long ago. Within Euro American racism lies this advanced form of anti blackness that, in many ways, has sought to encourage diasporic blacks to reject Africa and embrace Europe and North America. The justification has been, oh, Africa is too far. And diasporic Blacks have no place in Africa to claim as their own. Meanwhile, diasporic Europeans have no problem claiming their Irish, their Italian, their English and French heritage. We know the King of England still claims seats in governance in Canada and Australia. So it, it, it becomes a responsibility on us to ask and address the question, how then do we subvert the project of discouraging diasporic Blacks from claiming their Africanness? And this is why Black centricity advances a mode of thinking and thought grounded in that Ubuntu philosophy. The theoretical prism of Black centricity embedded in the Ubuntu philosophy affirms the synergy and convergences of Blackness and Africanness for a purposeful reinvention of an Africanness in a diasporic context. Black centricity represents, quote, a counter white episteme, a mode of knowing and a being that is deconstructive, reconstructive, and transformative, unquote, of what it means to be a Black scholar. Paraphrasing Yancey. As a philosophy of thought and method, Black centricity highlights land and earthly teachings lodged within bodies, cultural memories, histories, and ancestral spiritual connections in understanding the African Black humanness. Let me pause here for a second. I think we need to create educational spaces for learners to engage this and flesh our flesh knowings. We need to examine the particular discursive lens that we use for our intellectual and political critiques and interrogations while in these spaces. We need to develop a robust epistemological framework for understanding the Black existence and that inseparable connections to the motherland. And we need to re-articulate the relations of racism and its intersectionalities with conceptions of Blackness, Africanness, and the Black existential threat in the face of European white superiority and fascism. We need to explain and devise solutions to the Black learner experience in a white supremacist world. And we need to subvert internalizations of colonial oppressions and colonial relations within our own communities. I think it's very, very important, again, to quote the words of uh, Karinga, that we confront the death of our own intellectual imprisonment and our cultural estrangement, as well as dislocation while in the diasporic context. To do so is to cultivate and pursue and promote Black-centric Afrocentric and Afrocentric standpoints as a necessary exercise in our own decolonization. 
and we need to survey the ways our African fruits have in the west of Paki always been at the mercy of the fiction of others, unquote. A reframing of blackness must be approached in ways that do not empower whiteness and white supremacy. And one way we can do this is even to challenge and subvert the consumption and the appropriation of blackness by corporate capital, as NG talks about. We can also challenge the blackness that still desires whiteness. Black survival and black existential realities require dismantling of the ontology of blackness, which is grounded in the white gaze and white mythologies. But more importantly too, we need to work with the pedagogical lessons of black voyages across land and geospaces. This is how we can speak about the multidimensionalities of blackness, the intersectionalities that I spoke about, but also the cartographies of blackness. To see the priorities of black geographies as revealing the different black resistances, bless you and right. And to resist the dispossession of the black ontological register by rewriting black history, claiming black consciousness as an awareness of our existence and the salvation of the continuing completion of blackness with criminality and deviancy. Crucially, we also need to develop a sense of honor to black life and African life with a renewal of the black ethos. And we need to articulate in the spaces that we find ourselves, what I've called alongside with my student, Mary Carmen La Venueva, a speciology of blacknesses, which is to say that rather than insist that, or even argue that the spaces we find ourselves were not meant for us, we rather insist on making demands when we get into these spaces. Let me shift to the power of community and how this is very important for the articulation and pursuit of our Black scholarship. First of all, you know, there's the saying, it takes a place to raise a child. And I hear people say that all the time, right? People hear always say the time. Sometimes I wonder whether they understand what the African proverbial saying actually means. Of course, it takes a village to raise a child. But the fact is that you must have the village in the first place. In other words, you must work to create the village. That's what the proverb is saying. So it's not simply it takes a village. You must create the village. And we create the village by building communities. Despite our contestations, despite our tensions, despite our differences, we build communities. And we build these communities one break at a time. We know that within our communities, we find our spiritual and emotional backbone. And this backbone sustains us in wherever we find ourselves, both in our intellectual and political process. And this is why it's so important that communities, creating, working communities become important for us as educators, as learners, as students. And it is important also that we don't put our communities under the bus. That if our communities spiritually rejuvenate us, revive us, support us, that we do not put them under the bus in furtherance of our own careers. Our work must be about social relevance to our communities. Our work must be about paying debt to our communities by sustaining us we owe great debt to our communities and we need to pay those debts by making our work relevant. We only make our work relevant when we, we articulate and eschew the dialectic of black scholar and black scholarship. There cannot be an independence of a black scholar 
and black scholarship. Black scholar and black scholarship have to be in tandem. They have to work in hand. That the black scholar must be occupied, preoccupied with black scholarship. And it's here in that we can articulate this reframing of black authenticity as black skin with no marks. And in defining this role of the black educator and learner, we would like to propose a black repositioning or an authentic repositioning rather than a critical repositioning in the work of Harden. This authentic repositioning helps black learners to redefine our intellectuality in the collective global black struggle. It's an authentic repositioning. In other words, the designation of quote black must mean something special. It must be a scholarly calling, a polka face that embodies the true meaning of blackness as resistance, as resilient, and as authentic. There also has to be an unapologetic, that audacious, and that holistic understanding of blackness, a desire to speak with a distinctive black voice, a discursive politics that opposed the African spirit, the soul, the body, the mind, in a moment in history when blackness is under attack, given the ongoing necro politics, to quote the words of actually maybe. The intellectual politics of the black learner must draw on history, must draw on our cultures, our cultural, psychic, spiritual memories, using an abolitionist frame of thought and advancing a common black African humanhood. Our work must interrogate our institutions, schools, media, justice system, etc as casual places with dehumanizing effects on black mental psyche and well-being. These places are casual places, we must interrogate them as casual places. Our resistance, our educational resistance, is the only way to reclaim this black authenticity and to subvert the power and weight of the black, of the white colonial gaze. We cannot become products of our institutions. We cannot become products of our institutions. In other words, we cannot be intellectually processed in the ways of Namno, but rather we must become products of our own decolonization and resistance. In the words of Martin and Hani, it's important for us to see our institutions, our schools, as places and spaces for radical and speculative images, a place for us to be in, but not of. In other words, we have every right to be in these spaces, but we should not let these spaces make us who we are. This, is me, this means embracing a politics of, quote, fleeing without leaving. And this is a politics where we flee from the castral logics of these places without leaving the possibilities of creating critical spaces in which to work to subvert and to transform and to abolish. Again, Hani and Morton. Let me say a few words about integrating the inclusive education promise and fail. There is an ongoing and very, very legitimate critique of the institutional performances, the expectations and the commitment rhetoric, the lack of accountability and policies that are put in place but have no teeth on them. 
For example, we know that equity, diversity, and inclusion, which is pursued through that inclusive educational model, has often been a distraction for its race evasiveness, for its colorblind ideology, and the inability to name anti-Blackness, anti-indigeneity, and white supremacy. There is this feeling that sometimes these inclusive education initiatives are only served as appeasement to Black and Indigenous bodies. And I think it's a point that Renaldo Walcott also makes. These approaches enable the dominant, again here to quote Biko Mandela Gray, to do, quote, a penance and have their conscience cleansed, unquote, and be on the path of redemption, which in many ways is an approach that only gets in the way of true liberation. Therefore, we must be critical of the rhetorical appeals to whiteness in the pursuit of inclusive education. There are rhetorical appeals to whiteness in the pursuit of inclusive education. Inclusion into what? It's a question we must ask. But we must also ask the question, what schools do we want and are willing to fight for? We must begin by having the difficult conversations prior to doing this inclusive education work. Where is the institutional commitment? It cannot just be rhetorics. Where are the resources to back it up? We must also understand that there are structural and ideological changes that are required, they are prerequisites, in order to pursue inclusive, anti-racist, de-anti-colonial changes that we want in our schools. So how do we go for this interrogation? And here I want to delimit the critical boundaries for African versus Scotian learners in the set for inclusive education. Inclusion should be about starting anew. It should embrace the diversity of thought. It's not just having diverse bodies. Inclusion should also be about working with our different communities. The Black community is not homogeneous. It's heterogeneous. So working with our different communities. Thirdly, we need to tap into the rich history of community-rooted activism. There are important lessons in community-rooted activism, grassroots organizing, militancy, for their lessons and the critique for how institutions have been co-opted or how institutions have co-opted equity, anti-racism, and inclusive educational strategies. In Nova Scotia, there are numerous historic community educational work that we can draw on for their lessons for how we approach radical inclusive education. We know of the work of the Black Learners Advisory Committee, the African Baptist Association, the Black Educators Association, the United Front, the Black Lawyers Heritage Center, the Black Business Initiative, the Black Cultural Center for Nova Scotia, the Africville Museum, and of course, the Demo Body Lay Body Dale Learning Institute. We need also to deploy the philosophical teachings embedded in the Ubuntu philosophy for this radical, subversive, inclusive educational process. These teachings that are grounded on the land, the teachings, the land teachings, the relationality, the reciprocity, the sharing, the connections. Classroom teachings must focus on the white gaze and how it continues to erase the black body, black experiences, and black existential realities. Sex teachings must focus on black subjectivities in ways that allow our learners to connect to African and to our Africanness. 
These teachings must affirm black counter narratives as well as how we tell our own stories. There must be a focus on teachings of the land. And this is beyond the cartographies to insist on our different relations to the land. We have different relations to the land. Some are about disconnections, some are about displacement, some are about dislodging, as well as acknowledging and purging ourselves of the ongoing violence on lands. These teachings must focus on black subjectivities in ways that allow learners to connect to Africa, the motherland, and to connect to our Africanness. It must affirm black counter narratives. And it must be a pedagogy of the geographies of schooling, which would require that we connect to these teachings of the land. The connections with the land is very important because it allows us to appreciate our different very relations to the land, as I mentioned, the disconnections the displacement, the dislodging. But it also allows us to bring a critical reading of our existence on lands, which is to say we must work to address the ongoing violence on the lands on which we find ourselves. When we get lost on the land, when we don't do this connection to the land, when we don't reclaim our connections to the land, our ties to the land, we lose the body, the mind, the soul, and the spirit. But we also fail to draw on the power of our emotional, physical, and psychic connections with ourselves, with nature, and with our environments. At the end of the day, we are talking about our indigenous identities. These are about the connections with emotional, psychic, and physical relations to nature, with environments. It is who we are as a people. In teaching about blackness, we have to seek the connections with indigeneity and bring a radical relationality to blackness and indigeneity. In other words, blackness is about relationality. And in speaking about blackness, and indigeneity in relationalities. We're able to speak about dislocations, dispossessions, the intercessions of bodies and labor on lands and geospaces. These are things that other scholars have also written about Harris, Baird, Robin Maynard, Tiffany Keene, and many others. In teaching blackness, as Blake also Caution says there must be a corresponding focus on trauma-free blackness, where we pay attention to aspects of black life, joy, and happiness, not just the pain and suffering. In other words, to also move beyond, not away, move beyond the relentless and the persistence of black grief and anguish. It's not an either or. We can talk about black life, black joy. We also talk about black pain and suffering in that context. That is understanding blackness as existing outside of trauma. Black life that is not filtered solely through the lens of racism, but black life that is also through celebrations of music, arts, literature, sports, celebration of culture and community. And in teaching about blackness, we must hang on to this imperative of a black white prison, not a black white paradigm, but a black white prison. The black white prison is a lens, it's a perspective for reading society that everywhere on the global landscape, a closer proximity to whiteness is rewarded. 
while conversely a proximity to blackness is punished. This is globally everywhere. So moving away from a black-white binary should not mean that we don't work with a black-white prism because the black-white prism is a powerful lens for reading society everywhere. So in conclusion, let me reiterate a couple of points. One of the things I'm talking about black centricity as the power of black social thought, particularly in the black diaspora context, is reasserting this black and African consciousness. But this consciousness is meaningless without action, as Fanon a long time ago told us. Second, it's also very, very important for us to theorize Africa beyond its boundaries. Africa is not just a physical space. Africa is a spiritual, it's a psychic, it's emotional. It's a psychological space. <clears throat> and we must, <clears throat> excuse me, we must articulate Africa beyond its physical boundaries. In other words, there's an Africanist which is rooted on the continent, but there's an Africanist that can also be located in the body and it travels beyond time and space in psychic and in cultural memories. The very familiar saying that one is African, not because he or she was born on the continent, but because Africa was born in the person. <clears throat> Black centricity requires embracing Africanists as a political resistance and as a retracing of our histories, our cultures, and identities to Africa. Black centricity, like Afrocentricity, like Afrocentricity, <laughs> becomes an omnicentric prism, one which is holistic. It is attuned to relational spheres with more than humans, relation to our environments, and it challenges the anthropocentric ideologies and the prevailing colonial architectures of Western science knowledge. Black centricity, Afrocentricity, and Afrocentricity must be seen as epistemologies of decolonization and as metaphors of resistance with the implicit realization that decolonization cannot happen solely through Western science scholarship. This is why we need other perspectives if you are going to decolonize. And that these perspectives also must be embedded particularly for us as African peoples in the Ubuntu philosophy, which I have articulated, but particularly for the grammar of black educational futurity that it offers, which is a grammar that strives and lives for the future now, in the present, with lessons of the past to guide us in the search for new features. In other words, the past, the present, and the future, and I inspire our relationalities back and forth. Inspire our relationalities. It's not a linear progression. We don't move from the past to the present to the future. The past, the present, and the future are fused. And this will offer a grammar of educational futurity in the pursuit of radical education for our learners. This is why, for example, in teaching African history, it must be about reclaiming the past, reflecting on the present, and projecting onto the future. Reclaiming the past, reflecting on the present, and projecting onto the future. And in the words of Kiswahili, as we say, Asante Sana. Thank you.
Dr. Day, you brought us to church. I'm going to ask everybody to turn their mics on for a quick second. And you know what we say when we're in church and somebody gives us the word on the count of three. One, two, three. Amen. 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 And we're going to allow uh, just a quick 10 minute break. If you have questions, now is the time to put them in the chat. And we're going to check those questions out when we return. Uh, myself and Shauna K. Lawrence, um, we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Day. And then we're going to open it up to questions. If you have any questions you want to throw in the chat, do so. It is now 7.13 and we will be starting exactly at 7.23. We're going to take a quick break. Amen. <laughs>
The Delmore Buddy Day Learning Institute is focused on um, community engagement, working with youth. Uh, we also have the added value of providing published resources, and those are used in the public school system. And that process is really important because that's when voices are centered. Here at GBDLI, all of our work is focused through community through our youth workshops, through publishing, through research, even through holding this public space here for the community. Our research and youth department are dedicated to better understand the educational challenges that our black learners face here in Nova Scotia. We meet those challenges through community engagement, resources, youth programming, and research projects. A great example of our community engagement is our annual African Nova Scotian History Challenges. Students from across the province submit projects focused on African Nova Scotian leaders, activists, and communities. The real niche piece for us is participatory action research. We are about community, community voice, and setting ways for it to be heard. All right, welcome back, everyone. And um, <laughs> what a great evening it is. And for all of the scholars and the students, uh, and I'm speaking directly to my black students that are that are online today. Um, and then his uh, presentation, he said the designation black means something special. And we need to ensure all of our black students feel and know and understand that they are special. And for our black scholars um, and researchers on the line today, you know, one of the things that I'm so appreciate, appreciative, Nan, is my whole career, I have been centered and my work has been centered in blackness and doing what's right for black children. And I am unapologetically doing that. Um, throughout my career, I have been, um, people have tried to persuade me to, you know, connect other people and other things and other groups into my work. But I let everybody know, um, if we are doing right by Black children, we do right by all. And so I say that un unapologetically. And, and, and in your presentation, you said that as Black scholars, we have to be unapologetic, audacious. We have to understand and see it as a holistic education for all of us and have a desire to speak with a distinctive black voice. And so what you've done is you've confirmed our work. You've confirmed our work for us and given us, I don't wanna say permission, but letting us know we are on the right track and we are doing the work we are we are supposed to do. And, and working in education is, is discursive politics. <laughs> um, and so I can, I speak from a Nova Scotian perspective, born and raised and very proud to say I'm African Nova Scotian. And speaking from an African Nova Scotian perspective, when we look at what's happening in our schools, whether they be primary through 12, kindergarten, pre-K through 12, um, and in higher education, we are working within, I liked what you said, um, um, you know, in the colonial majority. <laughs> and I know even for myself in higher ed, I'm, I'm the only African Nova Scotian on my campus. Um, this year, I'm very grateful. We actually have another black professor that has joined us. And of course he's from Ghana. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and, and in our work, we, we find ourselves being unapologetically black and in those discursive spaces where we need to speak. Because if not us, then who? Yes. And yes. so when we think about um, the work that needs to be done and in terms of being inclusive so that, uh, I love what you said, in terms of being inclusive, we really need to scrap it. And we need to start from the beginning. Yeah. Because we were never included in the first place. 
And so when we think about discursive politics in all of our policies, including our inclusive education policy, where um, Black and African Nova Scotian and being culturally relevant are, are mentioned 18 times in the whole policy. And everything that we look at, whether it be um, the, the, the organizations that are dedicated to um, ensuring that our Black people remain um, are seen as the brilliant bodies mm -hmm. that we are. But when we look at the policies, when we look at our institutions, when we look at anything that sort of targeted for us comes at a deficit. Yeah. It does not look at us and in, in terms of our inclusion, the inclusive education policy as a deficit. We are a people that require support. We are a people that require interventions. We are not a people that are seen written on paper or in our schools as the brilliant people that we are. And so yeah. my question to you is, how can the organizations, and you listed them all off in your presentation, because mm -hmm. Nova Scotia is special in the fact we can't go to any other province and see all of those organizations right. that are government funded. Mm -hmm. But how can we work together to make sure that the work we're doing does not come as a deficit because of, like you said, as I don't, and I always say in my work, I don't care if you're black, white, purple, green, or polka dotted, we all came up and we all were educated within this colonial system. So it's mm -hmm. been ingrained in us that we are other. Mm -hmm. And from a black body to say to think that we are other mm -hmm. right, is a shame. Mm -hmm. So how mm -hmm. what advice would you give to our organizations so that we can operate from what we know as the brilliant black body instead of people who need intervention? Right. And I hope right. That's yeah. No, no, that's that's um um Wendy, that's a very important uh, question. And, and I think is this issue about um look, it's it all comes from where we start at, right? And starting with our knowledge base, right? And I think one of the things when you look at these organizations, these are all, we have well, communities towards people who have a history, right? Of fighting resistance, right? And they come into this politics with that. They come into these associations with that knowledge, right? So tapping into that wealth of knowledge, uh, which is not from a deficit model. I think uh, in many ways it's, it's challenging the status quo, right? And so working with that. And so when you talk about how do we move forward, it's how we share these histories, how we share the lessons, how we share the struggles, how we share the resistances that we have encountered in order to move forward, right? Uh, and I think to me, the power of community is our ability to connect with each other, right? We create communities, but communities must also work together, right? Uh, and and, and it's, it's, it's not something which, uh, it's not an easy thing, right? Because of sometimes we live in a system where we are set up to compete with each other. We are set up to, to actually be in, in sort of uh, that mode. And, and it's very, very important for us to step outside of that, right? And look at how community, the ethos of community, which is embedded in our knowledge systems, allow us to come together and work on our strengths, uh, to think through solutions. And like you said, if not us, who? Who is going to do it for us, right? We have to develop our own path and and and... And that's why when we talk of, say, elders in our communities, right, elder is not simply just by age. It's about how people perceive what you've done within the community, right? And I mentioned the point about where sometimes some of us in the in advancement of our careers, we put our communities under the bus, right? So rather than create communities, rather, that, rather than mentor the young ones, right, we see ourselves in competitive mood. And that has been to our detriment in, in, in that. And I also wanted to mention one point where you started off with, I mean, the designation of black, right? Um, you know, sometimes you hear people talk about, well, I don't want to be called a black scholar, I want to be called a scholar, right? Uh, I don't want to be known as a black scholar. Look, we need to be proud of our identities to be called a black scholar, right? To me, it's a badge of honor to, because in academia, to be a black a, a scholar in academia is going through the trenches, right? It's, go, it's, it's in war, being in war and being in struggle. And we need we need to 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 deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. Doctor Maki, your mic is muted. Amazing, thank you, Shauna. Okay, um, and one of the things that I heard, and that I hope the message can be spread out, uh, we as African Nova Scotians and all of our 
organizations that are all funded by this by the same government. They're all provincially funded. Um, we have to remember the money might come from the government, but we as a people yes. need to designate how we work, how we work together, and how we and 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 work as that community. And so I so appreciate that. And I just want to turn it up. And by the way, so Shauna K. Lawrence is um a master's student who's completing her uh, master's thesis. And she's also a Delmore Buddy Day Learning Institute scholar. And so we need to thank uh, DBDLI for um, helping Shauna Kay complete her education. And I'm going to turn the mic over to you, Shauna Kay. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Mackey. Um, thank you um, again to the DBDLI for um, all the support that you have been providing for me throughout this journey. And it was a pleasure listening to your uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Sifa Day. I've referenced your work so many times in my literature after being introduced to your work by um, Dr. Maki. Um, I just want to make some comments in regards to what I'm doing in regards to my own research, and then I have a question for you. So right. at the moment, um, my thesis is exploring pedagogical practices that best support the academic success of Black students in rural Nova Scotia. Um, I'm very proud of the work that I've been doing so far and the guidance that Dr. Mackey has been providing um, as I go through this journey. Um, some of the things that you mentioned in your presentation that stood out to me and really resonated with the work that I'm doing um, as a researcher, you said that when it comes to Black or African um, experience, the question has always been, how do we assert the locus of control um, in regards to our story and how um, our stories are told about right. ourselves and how this is represented um, throughout the um, throughout teaching and the essence of my um, thesis, as I said, it really focuses on the voice and the story of African Nova Scotia students and how this is um, how this is shared um, to the public. Um, I, I'm very very interested in their perspective and um, as a classroom teacher for five years or when I was in the classroom. That was the main calling for me in regards to why I went into research, because I realized that um, the voices of African Nova Scotia students need to be heard and mm -hmm. their stories are so important. And if as teachers, our goal is to ensure that um, our practices meet their needs, they're the ones who know exactly what they need as students. And we have to provide opportunities for their yeah. voices and their perspectives to be heard, because that's the only way we're going to know what the changes mm -hmm. are and meaningful and intentional changes um, in regards to curriculum practices and pedagogical practices to meet their needs. Yeah. Um, you also spoke about the challenges of Black education and um, the experiences of Black students and how it, oftentimes ex for them, it's experienced in a different way. So their experiences as a diverse group of students is is it definitely differs from what we're seeing in the classroom where they're surrounded with um, students from different um, groups. So I, I was thinking about that and I also linked it to an article that you wrote in 2018 um, where you talked about diverse learners and their experiences and how this is something that teachers need to be mindful of in their classroom and their practices. Because like you said in the article, now more than ever, we're seeing how in classrooms, we are experiencing diversity. And, mm -hmm. you know, the needs of these students are changing. So right. that's something that educators need to be mindful of when they're thinking about their planning and thinking about, um, you know, how they're going to make sure that they meet the needs of these diverse students. Um, the question I have, but then I have one more point. The question <laughs> that I have here is, um, thinking about the idea of um, Ubuntu and how you know it's centered in our practice, how can educators embed um, Ubuntu um, into their practice to ensure that they're meeting the needs of diverse students? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think w one of the key uh, principles of Ubuntu philosophy is around the question of the, the the teachings of the land, right? So it comes around these questions of relationality, community building. Uh, reciprocity, sharing those 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 ideas because it's about interconnections, right? Yes. And this is why educators need to work with that mindset, which moves away from the competitive, the individualistic mode, right? How do we build relations in the classrooms? How do we build communities in the classrooms? How do we ensure that 
look, the learners in the classroom see that each other's success is our collective success. Yes. And similarly, each other's failure is our collective failure, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much of, well, this child is doing well and that child is failing. Too tough luck for the one who is failing, right? Forgetting that sometimes it's the system, right? That that puts people in, in those, those positions. And I think bringing that Ubuntu philosophy really says that we are all in this, right? Yes. We are connected, right? The failure speaks for all of us. The, that student failure is our failure. Just as that student success is our so success. Yes. That there's not like individual success. There's that collective sense of success and the collective sense of failure. And we have to work with that mindset and, and, and bring in that philosophy into uh, And then the other philosophy is about the humanness, right? Mm -hmm. That seeing the humanity of the learner, right? That the learner standing there is not just a name, right? It's somebody with life, somebody with body, mind, soul, and spirit, right? And seeing that humanity is very, very important because it relates to how that learner is treated, right? If you believe in the humanity, right, of, 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 of the learner, right? It has implications for how you treat or how you relate with that with, 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 with that with that learner in, 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 in that sense. I want to come back to the point we made earlier about uh the power of telling our stories, right? Yeah. I think we need to restore our lives, right? Mm. Black lives, black lives have in many cases been storied by others. The audacity to think they know us more than we know ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And and we need to restore our own lives, right? And restoring our own lives is telling our own stories, yes, right. Tell our own stories. That doesn't mean that tell our own stories. We're going to tell only the gospel ones. We need to tell our stories in all the different shades, the different sizes, and different forms, right? But we have the power. We are set the local control in telling those stories, and that's why we need to empower our learners to come to voice, as Bell Hook talks about, right? Yep. To be able, right? I, I, I mean, I speak in Mankai. I know uh, some of my graduate students, uh, uh, and I know Fiona from my doctoral students is on the line, right? Um, sometimes we talk about it in the school classrooms where somebody says, "Well, going to Nana's classroom, the black, uh, racialized indigenous students speak a lot." And I've said, "Good, because they are in spaces where they don't just take up, right?" And so when they come to those spaces and speak out, this is the question about vocalizing our politics, right? And and being allowed to vocalize that politics is very very important in 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 that regard. And yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you you mentioned the connectedness, the connectedness of um community as well, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. power of coming together, yeah. which in essence is what Ubuntu is about. Yeah. Um, and the whole idea of community that yeah. also resonated um with the because I did my focus group with my African Nova Scotia students, and one of the things that they said that they want to see more of is that community piece. Yeah. and they spoke about the importance of you know, parents being involved in their education, Black teachers being involved mm -hmm. in their education, mm -hmm. and other educators, which mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, um, educators in general take for granted how this, old, this whole idea of Ubuntu means that we're all working together to ensure yeah. that our practices and um, policies even are, yeah. you know, meeting the needs of our students. So mm -hmm. one of the things that um, I wrote down is that, like I said, my, my Black students were very, very vocal, and I was very, very happy that I started this journey of research to hear their perspective. And I'm excited about, you know, completing this work with Dr. Mackey and sharing, because they, like their stories, like you said, their stories are so important. Their voices are so important. Their perspectives are so important. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe that, you know, if we want to see change in education, we have to take the time out to listen to what our students yeah. or Black students have yeah. to say, because yeah. they are the ones who are being um, affected by all these policies that are being, you know, um, enforced in schools. But where yeah. are their voices? You yeah. know, we can't we can't expect to see change if our students are not a part of the conversation when mm -hmm. it's their education that's being affected. So right. the idea of community was really, really big um, in my uh, in my focus group and just the discussion. And it, it just ties in well to what you have said about the importance of community. Right. Yeah. Awesome, Shauna Kay. By the way, I didn't pay Shauna Kay to say nice things about me. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay? And I think really it boils down to, Dr. Day, what you said. Until everybody in the building yeah. sees 
the African black student in their humanhood. Yeah. Unless yeah. we are seen as human. Yeah. Nothing will be done. And in the yeah. work that I do, it's about opening the eyes to show educators, well, the way you're treating students, you're robbing them of their dignity. And yeah. then they've internalized that. I'm going yeah. to turn the mic over to, um, uh, first, I also wanted to, speaking of black scholars, and I won't be able to mention everybody because I can't say everybody's names, but just to welcome other black scholars in the room, Dr. Ingrid Waldron, Dr. Kesa, um, Dr. Kesa Monroe, um, is with us and um and i'm sure there's others that i can't see their names but i'm gonna uh and i'm going to turn it over to sylvia and then dr susie okay <laughs> uh dr wendy are you turned over to me because i put something in the chat yes i figured it'd be the question would be better coming from your voice <laughs> thank you okay Nana, for, you know, they made it, it's a dangerous place when you gave me space. Because <laughs> <laughs> I need to just throw out the love and the respect that I have for you. I need to say that amongst everyone. Thank you so much for being with us all on this learning journey. So what, my, what I put in the question in the chat was, do you feel that tracing our identities to locations slash countries in Africa and the continent and other diasporic locations will strengthen us. Yeah, I, 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 I agree in the, the, the power of identity, right? Um, I think, um, and, and it's not just simply being able to trace your identity to a particular location, but what does that mean, right? What is the history of that place, right? And working with that. And I think to me, there's a strength in being able to do that, right? Uh, I talk about this sometimes with, um, when anytime I take students to, Ghana, right? And I do take students to Ghana as well, right? One of the emotional moments is when, when these students, the plane touches down at Accra Kotika Airport, right? And you see their eyes swelling with tears, right? It's about, again, coming back to roots, right? And and, and that. And it's it's very, very uh, uh, strengthening, right? That they're rooted, right? One of the things when I remember when we talk about the Black pathology, right? One of the things about Black pathology is the, the rootes, right? That we are, we, we, are, we are not anchored anywhere. And so to ground our learners, right, is part of that reclaiming of identity. And, and, and that reclaiming of identity is very important. And I think to me it's a strength, right? Because they begin to know that they are not a ruthless people, right? They are grounded people. They are people with a history. They are people with a base, right? They are people with a rich uh, tradition, right? And are able to articulate it. And the other thing about uh, uh, um, identity affirmation also is that um, it, it it can also be spiritual. It can also be uh, 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 emotional. It can also be uh, not necessarily physical, right? So to give you an example of that, right? Uh, uh, people talk about, look, Africa never leaves you. You may leave Africa, but it never leaves you, right? And but what I mean is that there's always the African in us, right? It's our responsibility to let it birth, to let it come out. Right. And and, uh, and sometimes some of us try to hide it. Some of us try to cover it. Right. But being able to let it birth, come to birth, to come out in the open. Right. It to me is a strength because it shows that you, are, you, you, you have you have a sort of identity affirmation that you want to affirm. And, and it's very, very important in one's journey. And, and being able to do that is very, very in, in, in important. There's a reason. Right. Well, say we have mothers, uh, say, would go to Lakeshore in Ontario. Right. To pour libation. Right. Uh, look, they are pouring libation to what? They are pouring libation to the ancestors. And the reason is that they will tell you, right, that as far as we're concerned, our ancestors who lost their lives when they were thrown overboard in the seas, right? When you throw something overboard in the seas, it, it swims, it floats. So as far as we're concerned, they might have swam and come to Lake Shore, right? So we are pouring libation to make that connection with the land, right? This is why in one of the PowerPoints, I was making the point about when we lose that connection with the land, right? And that connection with the land, is not just physical, it's emotional and psychological, right? When we lose that connection with the land, we lose our soul, we lose our spirit, we lose our mind in and, 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 and that sense. So that affirmation is very important. I believe strongly in the question, the power, because the colonizers did a dirty job on identity and language, right? And so anytime we get a moment to reaffirm our identities, that is a strength in, in that.
Thank you so much. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, we sort of know as a people, we can feel it. When we feel Africa within us, when mm -hmm. we feel that specialness of Bodhis, when we can say, I'm black and that's a that's a wonderful thing. Like we yeah. feel that and tracing that back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the mic over to another one of our black scholars. I don't know where she is on, in, in my Zoom look, but Dr. Susie Brigham. Hi. Yes, Susie. Oh, hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you, Dr. Day. Yes. I had a quick question. Sorry, I think there's a bit of an echo, but I apologize for that. Oh, I can turn the mic off? Okay, sorry about that. It's just, um... Oh, you, you've gone mute. Maybe you mute yours. Yes, the other person <laughs> should mute theirs because we can hear them. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I wondered if you could say something more about the need for authentic repositioning right. rather than critical repositioning. Yeah. So right. can the yeah. repositioning be both authentic and critical? Oh, yes. And shouldn't criticality require being authentic and vice versa? Yeah. And then what's required to know that we're speaking from an authentic Black voice, mm -hmm. especially as we are steeped in ideologies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, let's start with the question of the critical positioning and then the authentic repositioning, right? I, I think I will draw the distinction precisely because uh, you can have a critical positioning and repositioning without being authentic. Right. And we have a lot of that. I call that the freak radicals, right? There's a lot of freak radicalism that goes around, right? When the push comes to show, they are nowhere to be found, right? So they, they like to mouth off, mouth off, mouth off, right? So that's a critical positioning. But to be authentic is to be true to oneself, right? That this is what you believe in. You stand strongly before that. So to re respond to your question, yes, you can have both a critical and authentic. But for the most part, or no, I shouldn't say for the most part, so there are parts where people have, have this critical position and repositioning, which is not necessarily based on authenticity. It's about performances, right? They're doing it. Uh, basically, we think that there's a requirement to, to, to do that. So yes, we can have the critical and we can have the authentic, but I want to talk more about the authentic repositioning. The authentic repositioning calls for one sense, understanding what it means to be Black, what it means to be a Black scholar, right? and what it means to be authentic about that claiming. That's the notion about there's something about the no to be called black. There's something about it. It's about there's a history behind it. It's a history of resistance. It's a history that that name, right, must conjure up certain things that one has to live up to. And, and, and that's what I mean by that authentic positioning, right? Because otherwise, sometimes we can get into this zone where we are only critical, but we serve the critical as simply an intellectual exercise, right? Without being authentic to who we truly are in terms of our soul, spirit, body, and mind in, 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 in that sense. Right? Yeah. Yes, that, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Sure. Dr. Brigham, thank you so much for that question. And because we often see... Um, you know, black by convenience sometimes. Yeah. Uh, you know, we critically position ourselves when it when it can benefit us. Yeah. But when we do that work, like you said, nobody can be found. And so yeah. I love that adding that authenticity onto our positionality. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 so thank you so much. And we do have time for one more question. There's somebody in the chat. Um, oh. I think it's Moshala. Uh, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. They were saying they have a question. Okay, go ahead, Moshala. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, I was just thinking back to so many great, great bits tonight. I'm super grateful to be here. But when you were talking about um, how important it is for Blacks across the diaspora to claim their Africanness, yeah. right? And I, um, two years ago, I had the great fortune to work with a group of uh, young people um, 
on a cross-continental project. And we had two um, young artists from North Preston. We had two from Ghana, two from Zimbabwe, and two from St. Vincent in the Caribbean. And I can't tell you what all of the benefits of that project. And I was mostly interested in how that was impacting our learners from North Preston to be able to engage with Blacks from other parts of the world in their homeland. Yeah. I think very often there's lots of opportunities for us to engage with others when they come here to where we yeah. are. And yeah. that's a very different experience. Mm -hmm. But in terms mm -hmm. of getting a sense of how much we are the same, how much mm -hmm. we're cut from the same cloth, um, is that opportunity to engage with people in where they feel most at home. Um, yeah. And, you know, just there was so many, so many great moments where I could see them going, wow, okay, okay, yeah, we are the same. We have so much to learn from each other um, and we want more of this. Like, I just wanted to comment on that, but also to throw it out to the educators who are here um, in Nova Scotia, that happened virtually. It didn't cost us that much. Like, I, it's just a call out for us to do more of that for our African Nova Scotia learners or our Black learners who are here in this province. Give them chances to connect with others across the diaspora. Give them um, an authentic opportunity to connect in a way where they, because there's othering that's happening between us exactly. two. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And so this is a chance, um, learners at all levels, it, you know, we can connect, there's Teams, there's Zoom, there's all sorts of ways, but, and I'm seeing even on this call, there's people from not just here. So there's already network that's been connecting. Let's, let's get our learners to experience each other, regardless of where they are across the diaspora. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and, and and I think your your question in many ways also connected to CBS earlier question, which is the the strength in claiming identities, right? Uh, that's this reinvention of Africanness in the diaspora context is, is very important, right? Uh, because part of as I said, I said, part of that black pathology was to basically uh, separate us from that connection, right? And we need to make that connection, create it, reclaim it. Right, because when you deroot a people, when you de-anchor a people, right, it's easier for them to see, to see them as people who are not grounded, right, and 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 it serves the interests of black pathology, right. And I think it's very, very important for us to think about ways that we can reinvent our, our Africanness in the diasporic context, right, and, and because that itself is very very helpful to allow people to claim a sense of who they are and and that sense of that authentic self and and, and that. Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Moshella. And just to bring back to one of the points that you said, um, connected to Nana's presentation, when you first started off, and I believe this was in the in the clip that we showed from your presentation from the summertime, mm -hmm. when we talk about Ubuntu, when we talk about us as a people, I am because we are, we are because, yeah. you know, um, when we think about it, we together, and, and and because you brought us together tonight, Nana, we are that spiritual force that you mm -hmm. spoke about. Yeah. We are that spiritual force. And can you imagine if all, all of us on this call from the diaspora get together and in mm -hmm. this work, we, we represent what you're talking about, but we have to move beyond the once a year Zoom calls and we have to, you know, once once every other year uh, Afrocentric conferences. Um, and, and we do have to pool our sources because like you said, we can talk about it takes a village all we want, mm -hmm. but we need to build that village brick by brick and we need to start with ourselves mm -hmm. wherever exactly. we find ourselves and wherever we were born into the diaspora for us to be together because we are, and because of you, I know that I am and the rest of the scholars on here. And for this evening, um, you have brought us together in the spirit of Ubuntu. And we do not have enough thanks on this Zoom call um, to give you. 
the wisdom that was just shared. I just hope that we can all understand, to know, and to act, and to be, and to have that political responsibility to move this work forward and not bow down to the white supremacist spaces that we belong to. When we do things because that's the way it's always been done, and when we do things because that's the way they're doing it and we're trying to f see where we can fit in, we have to remember, we don't have to fit into the, their world. Yeah. We do not have to fit into their world. We need to share who we are with them, but we are not below. And yeah. so with that spiritual um, force and here, as you said, go out there and comp and I'd like everybody to make sure that they proclaim their specialness, proclaim their black rightness, wherever you are. Make sure people know who you are. This this has been amazing. This annual lecture could not be possible without the DeVoe Foundation. We need to thank I need to thank the DeVoe Foundation, the DeVoe Trust, and Miss Janine DeVoe, who donated her money so that um, because she was tired of seeing black people being othered. And she entrusted um, her nephew, uh, Bill Gunn, and Bill Gunn is here. And um, I know that the DeVoe Fund personally has helped me in, in, in gaining my PhD. Um, I owe a lot to the DeVoe Fund. Um, if people want to know how they can get involved with the DeVoe Fund, just so you know, the DeVoe Fund gives every African Nova Scotia student who comes to St. Effects um, a scholarship. And then if students are maintaining their grades, they get a scholarship every year until they graduate. When you donate to the, don uh, the DeVoe Fund, your funds are matched by the trust itself. And then we have a separate one um, scholarship for uh, any um, Black person going into education that was born in Nova Scotia. Um, and so the fact that um, Bill Gunn continues to, to help us I can't say enough about that. I need to thank all of the staff of Delmore Buddy Day Learning Institute, especially Kay Ann Scott, the amount of hours that she has put in to making this lecture happen is quite amazing and quite astounding. So Kay Ann, I don't know if you can put on your, your, your camera so we can see who you are, but the work you've done, I mean, and, and, and internationally, um, working with uh, Dr. Day while he was in Toronto, then working with Dr. Day on the <laughs> time while he's in Ghana. The work that you've done, Karen Ann, um, is amazing. Thank you to um, Randy uh, Delory who opened us up this evening. Of course, Sylvia Paris. I just want to let everybody know that there will be a brief survey that goes out um, in the coming days. So look for our survey. We encourage you to fill it out because your comments are going to help us to grow. Um, on, by, on, on behalf of myself and my students, Shauna Kay, um, we can't give you enough love, Nana. I mean, you're amazing. You inspire me. Like every time I hear you, I want to then go now. I need to go write a paper because you just love <laughs> me so much. Um, and on behalf of everybody that took time out of this very busy time of year for joining us, um, thank you so much. And we'd all like to wish you happy holidays, Merry Christmas, happy Kwanzaa, Dr. Day. I know it's getting late there in Ghana. Thank you so much. Sure. And can we all just have a round of applause for Dr. Day, please? <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Nana. Thank you, Nana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to add happy, but belated birthday to Nana. <laughs> oh. It's happy Hi, birthday. George. Hi, George. It's Ingrid. How you doing, yeah, George? It's Ingrid. Hi, hi, hi. How you doing? <laughs> yes. Good. Still, hey, doing the, still doing the good work, George. Good for you. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Ingrid. Hi there. Sylvia. Hi. Hi, my Nova Scotian friends. Yes. Yeah. We missed you. Come visit anytime. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Now, you know, we as a people, we, we are relational. So you might as well just put your cameras on and say hello to That's me. right. Because <laughs> say, this is the way the party goes. I don't know who you're trying to fool. <laughs> hey, Lorraine. Right,
<laughs> there, I turned Thank off the you. recording so we can see ourselves. There's Kesa. Hello, 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 everybody. Yes. Hello, hello. Yeah, hello, Kesa. Hello, 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 Dr. Day. Matt, hey. Thank you for everything. Look at look at the future, the young future on camera. Make Edward Jones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was so attentive. He has his own earphone uh, on and everything. He look at that. Whole, uh, he got the whole <laughs> thing, man. <laughs> changes of foot, changes of foot. That's right. You know, to catch them when they're young, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi, Bill Gunn. How are you? <laughs> Hi, Bill Gunn. Oh, he, hi, Bill no, Gunn. No, he's moving around. Hello. He's coming on camera. Oh, no. Yeah, I know. He doesn't like when I say his name, so I'm just going to keep saying it. Hi, Bill Gunn. <laughs> oh, I don't like that. Wendy, behave. Right? <laughs> Do Dr. Wendy, behave, please. Okay. <laughs> no, I, don't start now. I'm just going to say that. What? What? You want to change of change of personality? Wendy, tell us the story right quick that we I, Come on. What story? Yeah, what you just said, what you shared with us earlier. You are, can you tell us? Oh, happy? I just got my letter today yes. uh, from the Rank and Tenure Committee that the president has accepted the recommendation and I will be receiving tenure in July mm -hmm. and promotion in September to associate <laughs> professor. Ooh. Ooh. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as the letter gets to me, I ran away, so it's like, <laughs> Congratulations. This is like a day for memory for lots of things, right? Oh my gosh, awesome. Right? Like yeah. and, what a, and, and what a better time to get this message, right? Right. Just Talk when you had the conversation. Can't wait, you know, so that's that that's that's yeah. I, I, I can't even stop smiling right now. That <laughs> I said it out loud. I just remember oh. myself. Oh somebody that will is... have a love holiday <laughs> awesome awesome congratulations <laughs> sister congratulations so much. congratulations yeah. Wendy. way to go mm -hmm. yeah. thank you <laughs> good night good night everyone good night take care <laughs> okay. the man has to sleep. Hey, he has to thank sleep. you look at all your hard work <laughs> I told you. thank you nana <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. good night thank you good night <laughs> Oh, oh my goodness. Shawnee Kay, it's so good to see you again. Yes. <laughs> Did you know, Dr. Mackey, that I haven't seen Sylvia for, the last time I saw Sylvia was, was 2018 or 2019. And we saw each other at um at Spring, was it Spring Hill? Spring, when they Spring had, Hill, yeah. When they had that. That's um, right, because you were online for the Afrocentric Conference. You you weren't at the Afrocentric Conference. Yeah. yeah. I also saw Dr. Up, uh, I saw uh, Robert Upshaw as well. Yes. I haven't yeah. seen him in a while, too. And yeah. look who we got online here. We got Miss Lorraine Reddick. <laughs> we got rain on the line. We got the rain hanging out in there, holding their things up. Right. You got my neighbor. Right. You know, the rain only lives five, five houses up from me. Right. Oh, I thought you rode on Old South River Road. No, Viewville girl. Didn't you used to live on Viewville? <laughs> yeah, I well no, I lived on um Cunningham, so just right oh. in that same area, right in the cul-de-sac. No, I think Listen. I had you out by uh, by